This is the entrance to the Kelvedon Hatch secret nuclear bunker, the would-be home of central government in the event of a nuclear attack. The bungalow was uh, built to look like an innocent farm cottage so that no one would know that it hid the bunker which is under the hill 150 yards to my left hand side. In 1952 the government took uh, 25 acres of land from my grandfather, we're a farming family, and bulldozed the hill away and built the bunker. And we've entered the bunker and we're now walking down the uh, corridor, it's 120 yards long and it's the entrance into the bunker which is hidden in a hill. Its usefulness uh, would have been as a defence because it would have stopped the likes of you and me from getting into the bunker, but also of course to get into the actual hill itself. The whole bunker was built in 1952 for the Cold War, purely for the Cold War, nothing to do with the Second World War at all. And the idea was that some of central government would have come here and would have governed this part of the country and London in the event of a nuclear attack or some other uh, major catastrophe. Luckily, of course, it was never used, but it was active right the way up till 1994. The bunker itself is on three levels. Uh, we are fully self-contained, we have our own generators, we have our own food, we have our own water, obviously all buried underground, and the idea was up to 600 people would stay here for up to three months without having to go out at all. You and I, of course, would have been enduring temperatures of minus 45 degrees or so, there'd have been no birds, people would have been, many millions of us would have been dead, and it would have been fairly miserable out there with scavengers trying to get food, marauding gangs, of course, murdering and raping. And that is, of course, why you need this bunker to maintain the rule of law. So this is the Home Office radio room. Its job was to talk to the civilian side of the country to let us know what was happening, where we had to go for any medical help, where the food supplies were, and uh, generally, of course, just communicate and let all the public know, or a few of us that would be left, what was happening. We've reached the end of the tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel there are the large blast doors. They each weigh about a tonne and a half, and once they're shut, the 600 occupants would be in here for upwards of three months, locked in, and hopefully they will be self-contained and would manage to survive, to be able to allocate surviving resources to the likes of you and me. Okay, well this room was known as the floor. It's the plotting floor, and it's uh, exactly what it says it is. On this uh, cold perspex here, bombs when they dropped would have been marked. The red ones are uh, ground bursts. They produce the worst radiation because they pick the dirt up. That gets thrown into the air and that's what gets taken along and then tinkles down off us. And so the people here would have been plotting where the bomb had gone off and where the radiation was spreading to so that they could evacuate people from the path of the radiation. Although we were in charge of uh, London and this area of England. There were 11 other bunkers in the country and had the next one to us been knocked over, well then of course we would have taken over from that. Ground bursts of course were the worst as I've said, but air bursts were not so bad because they didn't produce so much radiation, it was just the blast that killed us. Government would have split into regional areas and the person who was here would have uh, been like God to us, he would have had the power of life and death. But not only did we plot uh, what was affecting us immediately, but of course we were also talking to Europe, and so we would have plotted where bombs had gone off on Europe and whether the wind was blowing towards us, because it's the radiation that's more likely to kill you than the blast itself. This is the back door to the bunker, another set of blast doors, and once you're outside here, of course, you're in the outside. This is where the fresh air would come into the bunker, and it would go through the filters over here, if there had been a war, otherwise, of course, it would bypass them, and then it would go into the plant room where the secondary filters are. All this other equipment here are just giant coolers. One of the biggest problems in the bunker, if you had 600 people down here, was keeping it cool. Uh, each human body produces a kilowatt of heat an hour, and so if you, uh, if you had that number of people, you would need to keep it cool rather than uh, keep it hot, which is what most people think. The air vent is, uh, is over there and uh, that's where the air comes in. It's got a canopy over the top, so that the radiation, hopefully, which is carried on dust, wouldn't have come down here in vast quantities. Well, this is the plant room, and all the equipment behind me is just one giant refrigerator, which was obviously there to keep the bunker cool. The fresh air from outside would have come through the primary filters, and then through the secondary filters, which would have obviously done their bit, then through a fine mist of water to scrub 
any dust out that was still remaining, which of course is carrying the radiation, before then getting pumped throughout the bunker. So this is the, the heart of the bunker. This is where the, the livelihood would have come from. Well, we're now on the middle floor. This is the government and uh, uh, government department floor level. The commissioner here, he would have been a cabinet minister and he would, as far as we're concerned, have been in charge of, of everything in this area. He was supported by his principal officer, who would have been a ordinary uh, minister, or of course he might have been just a senior civil servant. And his job was just to back up the commissioner in all the difficult decisions that he had to make, and of course give the poor old commissioner a time to have a little sleep. Had the prime minister come here, well then he would have had this next room here. The prime minister wouldn't have actually run this bunker. He'd have done what prime ministers do, try and negotiate peace and that sort of thing. But the commissioner, the cabinet minister, he'd have been the man who had life and death in his hand and would have organised our uh, survival, those of us that had survived. Well, this is where the government departments were based. Uh, you'll see they've got the Ministry of Transport, Ministry of Housing, uh, Ministry of Public Building and Works, the Judiciary, Ministry of Defence. All those, those government bodies would have had representatives here and their sole job here was to allocate surviving resources to survivors. They were fairly crowded in here, there were 450 of them, and they were going to have to uh, stay down here for the three months, and so they would have found it quite tedious working two shifts and only having one off. This is just a storeroom. Uh, it looks old-fashioned down here, we've got typewriters, but of course after the bomb had gone off, which is when we come into operation, there wouldn't have been any electricity, and so typewriters would have been what you would write letters with. You uh, were issued with pencils, and you couldn't get a new one until you'd returned the stub. And because uh, there were no more WH Smiths outside there, you were also issued with a little tube that you could put the stub in so you could write right the way down to the very bottom. We also had here uh, Geiger counters. They were pretty important. Of course, if you were going to go out uh, once the three months had come up, you'd want to know what the levels of radiation were. And so you'd have had a Geiger counter that would have told you that uh, information. Okay, well, this is the sick bay. If you were down here for three months, it's certain that somebody would get into some sort of trouble. So there's a very basic operating theatre here as well. Uh, there are coffins here. They'd have been cardboard coffins. Cardboard coffins fold up and uh, don't take up much room. And you'll see also in the far corner there are body bags. Uh, you could only stay in a body bag for about three days. After that, the body bag blew up and uh, exploded like a balloon. And so it was quite important that you shaft the dead, if you had any, outside the door fairly quickly and dispose of them out of the, out of the bunker. Obviously the bunker has got uh, running water and electricity from our generators, but once the bomb had gone off, water would be limited. So though we've got 24,000 gallons of water buried underground uh, on, on top of the bunker, we'd have also had uh, uh, Elson type lavatories that you would have used so that they flush those down just the once to conserve the water. Dormitories were uh, fairly uncomfortable. As you can see, they've got bunk beds. They were using the hot bed system, rather like on a submarine. A chap would have his eight hour shift in bed, he would get out, and then the next person would get straight in his nice warm bed uh, to take over for the next shift. Everybody was issued with a, sort of a sheet made like a sleeping bag, so that they had their own, uh, own little bed clothes. The interesting thing is, is that uh, in the last years, they held an exercise here. And what they discovered was that every time someone came to bed on the shift system, because there are no bedside lights, of course it woke everybody else up. And so you actually got very little sleep anyway, and very little sleep even if you were in bed having your sleep period. Well, this is the canteen. It's fully operational, as indeed it was during the uh, time that this would have been used. We're open as a tourist attraction every day, and so uh, its use obviously is to feed the public now rather than feeding um, people who would have been down in here. Well, this is an entrance that we had to make for the fire brigade. As you see, we had to bore through the 10 foot thick reinforced walls. They're reinforced very heavily. It's jolly good concrete. And the whole bunker is encased in this 10 foot uh, concrete together with uh, uh, a Faraday cage, which stops anything uh, coming in. 